Well, good morning. Welcome to our service here this morning. Can I just give you a couple of announcements before we start? That this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, instead of a prayer meeting, we'll be having a, a virtual carol service. Graham and, and uh, Colin, I think, have organised that. So 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. Um, if you don't have the link, I sent the link out in the emails, but if you don't have the link, give me a call or put it up and I'm sure Colin can give you the link for that. And then on Christmas Day, we'll oh, a short service at 11 o'clock for possibly half an hour just, just to allow you to, to share Christmas with each other, just to say a Merry Christmas. And if you've got a, something to say, then uh, a wee blessing, then just uh, bring it along with you and we'll give you an opportunity to share that. Anyway, as we come this morning, we come to give thanks to God for his goodness and his grace and his mercy to us. And in that, and in the times of trouble that we're in, I just want to read Psalm 8 this morning. Psalm 8, that great psalm that says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning that you are in total control of all over all that happens here, Lord. And this earth, Lord, you are sovereign. And we give you thanks for that this morning, Lord. In these difficult times for many people, Lord, we thank you that indeed you are the God who watches over us, that the eyes of the Lord are upon those whom he loves. And so, Father, we, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to gather together as a fellowship. I thank you for our fellowship here in Kaluk, Lord, for all those who are part of it, Lord, and for all those who have ever been part of it. And for all those who ever will be part of it, Lord, I give you thanks for them all, Father. We thank you that you are Almighty God, that you are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and the end, Lord. You know all things. Nothing surprises you, Lord. Nothing happens in our lives or in this world, Lord, that you don't know before it happens. And so, Lord, we thank you today for all that you do for us. We pray for our governments, etc., Lord, and, you know, it's a, they're, they're certainly a hostage to fortune at the moment, Lord, if they're not trusting in you. So, Father, we, we just pray for that this morning. Pray for all who are struggling this morning, Father, and we'll pray for them later, Lord. So be with us, Lord, and we thank you for calling as he brings the word this morning, Lord, and for just sorting out the meeting for us, Father, and for Robin as he brings the praise and the worship, Lord, so... Lord, as we, as we come to worship you and to praise you and to gather around your word, Lord, I pray that you would put that extra special blessing upon us this morning, as you always do. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, for all of these things. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Robin now to, for some praise and worship this morning. Over to you, Robin. Okay, good morning. And Colin's going to do some words for us. We're going to... Well, it's Christmas, so we're going to start with a, with a carol. <laughs> we're going to sing Who Is He in Yonder Storm. Hopefully, the words come up. You know the first way I've anyway. Who is he in yonder storm? At whose feet the shepherds fall? At his feet 
is the Lord, oh wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory, at His feet we humbly fall, crown Him, crown Him, Lord of all, who is He, who from His throne Dead simple. It's a simple chorus. In Bethlehem, one holy night, a host of angels filled the sky. They sang to tell the Our Savior comes this Christmas day. God is with us, Christ our Savior, Jesus our Emmanuel. He shall reign our King forever, the hope of Israel. from the beginning again 
Lord, we do thank you for for who you are, Lord, and for the hope that we have in you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your mercy, for the great love that you've shown to each one of us, Lord, as you've, you've called us according to your purposes, Lord. You've set your mark upon us. You've, you've set your seal upon us. You've saved us through the blood of Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you for him, Lord. We thank you for his birth as we celebrate at this time of year, Lord, but we thank you also for the death that he bore on the cross for us, that our sins might be forgiven and that the way might be made for us to be put into the place where you created us to be, Lord, to worship you, to honour you and to glorify your name. And Lord, we do thank you for this meeting this morning. We thank you that we're able to come and share and fellowship with each other, Lord. We thank you for each person that's represented here for each home for each household that's represented here today and we do ask lord that you would bless us as we gather we pray for jim as he leads the meeting lord we ask that you would you would be with jim we, we thank you for him lord and for his ministry for him and dorian lord for the the ministry that they've had in this fellowship over so many years and we thank you for colin and jacqueline as well lord and for the the, the, the great work that they do for the fellowship too and we pray especially for Colin this morning as he would bring your word to us we ask Lord that you would bless your word to us Lord that you would you would speak to us through your word this morning so Lord we do commit this time to you we just bless you and thank you in Jesus name Amen well thank you Robin that was 
break back in the spirit of the carols and stuff like that, and a new one, one I'd not heard before, but a lovely, a lovely sentiment in that second song there. So thanks again. Well, I, I didn't get the birthdays this morning, but here we are. Here's some birthdays for you. Callum Brown is birthdays on the 22nd. Susan Duncan is on the 22nd. All right, Susan. Give me thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. Kirsty Kerr's on the 23rd. And I think Bridget's husband, Derek Des, he's on the 25th. It would appear he's a Christmas Day baby. So for all of you who have birthdays this week, the Lord bless you and have a happy birthday and and a Merry Christmas. And so I'll hand over to Colin now as he brings the word. Over to you, Colin. Thank you, Jim. Um, this morning we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke's Gospel in Chapter 1 this morning. So, so we're very close to Christmas now, so we're going to do a Christmas-themed message to, to some degree. And we're very familiar in some aspect with the, the full Christmas story and the, the different characters that surround Christmas. Today we're going to look at a kind of focus on two characters and then moving on to, to a third. And the two characters we maybe don't focus on just as much are that of Zachariah and Elizabeth during the Christmas story. So the mother and father of John the Baptist, who we read of in the Gospel of Luke here. So their account comes just before the account of Mary, um, so Mary that would be the, the mother of Jesus. So, so we're in the Gospel of Luke this morning from chapter one, so we're getting the details from, from this Gospel here. So as I know about Jesus being born of a virgin birth, born of Mary, this miracle baby, but there's also the other miracle baby, that of Zachariah and Elizabeth, which we're going to look at this morning. They also experienced this kind of miraculous birth as well. So Luke, the, the author here, was writing to a kind of non-Jewish audience at this time. He's explaining, obviously, the birth of Jesus that was going to come, this promised Messiah, who is linking it through all the signposts through the Old Testament as well, which also is bringing the kind of John the Baptist aspect as well. So this morning we'll just read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, from verse 5 at the moment. So there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So we're seeing the two characters come in here. So first of all, Zacharias, it says in the New King James, if you read the NIV, it's, um, it's Zachariah. So the name Zachariah, obviously we're familiar with that name, it's a strong biblical name, a good heritage behind that name, we've got the strong prophet, Zachariah, the, the well-known major prophet of the, the Old Testament, and that kind of name had a strong lineage, a strong kind of character about it, and we read that this man here, Zachariah, in gospel, the look of Gospel of Luke here, he's a priest, a certain priest named Zachariah here, so he's a, a priest, he's got that kind of role to fulfil at this time. So he's in a role as a priest and he's got this, this name, Zacharias, a strong name, a strong lineage, a strong role that he is fulfilling. And he also is living near Jerusalem as well, so in a very important place that he's living in as well. And we probably don't focus on him that often, specifically when we're looking at things, because his son was John the Baptist and we've got a lot to focus on him and we can look at his life and his ministry and things. And we can obviously look over sometimes some of the kind of minor players within the stories within the Bible. So that's the father, Zachariah. The mother, the wife, Elizabeth, she was of the family of Abijah, and they were the tribe of Levi. So we could kind of say Zachariah was a kind of a priest, and she was a kind of priest's daughter. So a kind of pastor marrying a pastor's daughter. You know, that's kind of strong, strong family here, strong God-fearing family that we've got. They were very well connected to each other, very well matched and suited. And the verses say they were both righteous before God. It's a good match, a good couple, but one thing that didn't go their way was they had no children. They prayed for a child, but no child had came. In verse 7 it says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So first of all, Zachariah, he's getting on in years, maybe he's advanced in years, so quite an old, an old guy. And his wife, it says that she was also well advanced in years and she was barren. So basically she was beyond childbearing age. 
some that wasn't the calves anymore. They prayed and hoped for this child for a, for a baby, and it just did not happen. And the time is gone. It's gone and dusted. That that's in the past. It's something that we weren't really hoping for, or expecting at any point now, because you know it was just impossible for it to, to take place. And we know from looking into things ourselves and from certain studies that to be childless, to be barren for a female, particularly in this culture, was a bad thing. There was quite a stigma attached to it. A lot of people would be saying that she had sinned in her life in some shape or form, and that's why she didn't have a child. That was a kind of result of that. But the scriptures tell us here that's not the case. We're both righteous before God, but the outcome of being childless remains here. And we see a wee principle there from, from this account. Whether we're going through hard times, if we get afflictions, diseases, if we feel something's been, been withheld in our own lives, some people would tell you that is down to having sin in your life or something wrong with you, something you've done, something you've said, some sin between you and God. And that's symptomatic of, of that in your life. But we see here that's not the case. And in our own lives, that's normally not the case either. It's just sometimes the randomness of life. And here what we see is that God had something for Elizabeth and Zachariah. In the midst of the withholding situation that they see here with the child, God was in the midst of that, and he was going to deal with that. He had a plan and a purpose. So we've got this kind of upstanding couple here, and they've got no one that they could pass on their family name to, no child to rear, no more Zacharias in the family. So it would seem that this kind of history, this authority, this kind of promise would end with these two people, with this husband and wife there. It's no wonder they'd prayed for years and years hard for, for a child, for a baby boy to continue on the name, but that had all done and dusted past, they kind of forgotten about that, they'd ran out of time, ran out of the hope of that possibility. And as it seems, as it quite often seems in the Bible, maybe in our own lives as well, that God's answer was no, or at least not yet. And we see through the account of this story here in Luke's Gospel that God had his reasons for it. So once the father Zachariah was in the great city of Jerusalem, again, something special happened to him. He had a special visitor. So from verse 8 it says, So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense and he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. So obviously he was a priest, and we could say he was kind of called, called to jury duty, so it's been called to fulfil his, his role, to, to take his time within the temple. I think it's back in Chronicles some here, we read of the, the priestly tribes and broken into different groups, and each group would take their turn serving within the temple. So it was now Zachariah's group's turn to go into, into the temple to conduct this worship scenario. And something even more than that, he was chosen for an even specialer duty, for this kind of extra duty to take place. From among all the kind of throngs of priests at the temple at that time, he was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies to lead the worship there, to bring the people closer to God and to burn the incense in that place. It's a huge privilege for him at that moment in time. I kind of, not that I'm saying you should do the lottery, you shouldn't, but I kind of lottery ticket, lottery winning ticket moment, you know, something totally unexpected, you wouldn't think that you'd be picked to do this, but he was picked for a special duty to go into the Holy of Holies here, that he was going to stand before God as a representative of the people. So he would get to burn that incense, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So then he went to the Holy of Holies, and then this happened, this kind of special visitor appeared to him in this very special place to give a very special message to him as well. And it should be on verse 19 who it was. It was the archangel Gabriel. So just reading from verse 13. But then the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. You shall call his name John, and you shall have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, to the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the angel tells him, do not be afraid. And then outlines to him that he's going to have a son and what a special son that son is going to be. And it seems obvious, obviously, reading through this, it's like I, they just prayed for a child, they prayed for a son, for a boy, a baby boy. And even reading through this account here, seeing what the angel Gabriel spoke to him, I think it's maybe even possible he didn't just pray for a boy, but he was praying for maybe the, the national scenario as well. You know, if we look at the context, Zachariah is in the temple. His focus is on Israel, the people, bringing the people closer to God. He's offering incense on behalf of the people. He's just prayed repeatedly for this child. But what the angel Gabriel says is this child's going to come, but also says what the child's going to do. I think in some shape or form that Zachariah had also been praying for the nation of Israel, for them to be brought closer towards God. Because the angel Gabriel saying, no, this child's going to bring people back to God, to turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers again. So this child's going to do a special task, have a special ministry as well. And he's told about this son to give him a name, John. And I'm sure Zachariah thought, no, <laughs> you've got it wrong, Gabriel, you've got it wrong, God. My son's going to be called Zachariah after me and my family and my lineage. Um, and, uh, you know, John Zachariah is kind of amazed at this. He's came across this angel. He's afraid. He's confused. He's got all these thoughts and things going on in his head. But one of the thoughts and feelings that he also has is doubt, which comes through quite clearly as we read the full account of the story here. He's basically going to ask the angel, I need proof of what's going on here. You no. Know, I need more. I hear you, I see you, I'm afraid of this has happened, but I need more. So a chase of doubt does creep into the priest's mind here, and he does question Gabriel. And Gabriel obviously sees this doubt within him. So in verse 18 it says, And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and will not be able to speak until these days, and you will not be able to speak the day, I will start again, you will not be able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which were fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. <clears throat> and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So there should have been some exciting news that Zechariah could come out of the temple and tell the people, but he couldn't. He was struck mute by the angel Gabriel here. And the reason for that was doubt. Zechariah's question came to the angel, and it was a doubting question. How shall I know this? Essentially what that's translated to is, how can I be sure of this? So the angel appears to him, gives him a message, and he says, how can I be sure of what you're saying? How can I be sure this is true? How can I be sure this is going to happen? But again, just think where he is. He's in the central room, the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, within the temple. This special, amazing place that he's in, this one-in-a-lifetime opportunity that he's conducting to bring the offering in that place. Special place, special task. He's the priest before the people doing this, doing this offering for the people. The rarest of times, and if an angel was to appear to anyone anywhere, it would, you, know, you would expect in that place the Holy of Holies. But still he's saying, how can I be sure? I'm not quite trusting. I'm a wee bit doubtful here. Prove it to me is essential what he's saying in some shape or form. So he wanted a child badly, but we can maybe kind of deduce from the account here, he's kind of given up on it. He's wanted a child for so long, but now he doesn't have the power really to believe in the message that the angel has given him here. So Zachariah doubted. And again, think about his job. His job is to teach people about God, to bring people before God, to inspire them to be people of faith. And he is a trusted friend and follower of God. But even an angel appearing to him face to face in the Holy of Holies, wasn't enough for him. And all I can say is think about ourselves. There's hope for us all yet. If Zachariah doubted in those circumstances, 
when we doubt. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but you know, we shouldn't hold ourselves be so guilty about it, you know, doubting this part of the Christian walk. But what we need to do is to move from a point of doubt to, to a point of faith, which we're going to see Zachariah do, and which we can do in our own lives as well. So we can consider this as well. If they didn't believe God would give them a child, why did they pray to God for a child in the first place? And I wonder in our own lives as well, when we pray for things, do we pray and ask of the Lord, but not truly believe that he can do what we're asking? Not truly believe that he's going to come through with our prayers and give us an answer to our prayers as well? It seems that Zachariah had given up and now he was so amazed he couldn't quite believe it. In our own lives, do we give up in prayer as well? And the wee encouragement we've got here is, even if we give up, God is still moving, God is still active, and God knows what you have prayed for. And don't be too amazed and doubt, un, undoubting if he actually comes through and gives you the answer to your prayer. So what we see really is unbelief is a sin. The fact that he prayed for a child and then failed to believe when the message came just added a further weight to his unbelief here as well. So disappointed with his response, the angel reminds Zachariah really of who he is. He says, I am Gabriel. I'm the one who stands before God. I'm the one who God sent to come before you. Remember who God is. Remember who I am as well. And he then goes on to say to Zachariah, because of your reaction, because of your doubt, you'll now be mute. You'll be unable to speak until these things are fulfilled, until this child comes, until what I've told you actually takes place. And the reason for that is you didn't believe my words. This is what's going to happen to you because you did not believe my words. And they struck Zechariah mute. So Zechariah left the temple. He couldn't tell a single person about what happened to him because no words could come out. He couldn't speak. He could maybe can he do signs and things, but he couldn't really fully explain to people what had happened to him. And what we really see there is it's an example of sometimes our actions and our speech, what we say, what we do, and our reactions to things have unpleasant consequences. Gabriel proclaims muteness upon Zachariah and response is unbelief. And sometimes there's consequences to the things that we say, do, or the way we react to people or situations as well. And we need to be careful of that also. So we might think of oh, the angels are a wee bit kind of harsh here and Gabriel is harsh. Why? Why treat him that way? Why strike him mute? But the angel really just perceived it was a total feeling of unbelief within Zachariah at that point. And the angel wanted to do something with Sakai, to change his heart, to change his outlook, to change his doubt into faith, so as he could actually move forward with faith in his life. So Zachariah was at a period of doubt. And we can ask ourselves as well, are we at a point of doubt with something in our own lives? Are there some questions about God that we are wrestling with? Some things that we've asked the Lord of and we're still waiting and we're doubting and we're wrestling with that situation as well. As I said a wee, a wee minute ago, doubt is a natural part of our faith journey. But we do need to be careful with our doubt that we take it to God and allow him to do a work in our lives to bring faith into us, to move us away from that doubt. And that's something that he can do when we rest into him pray to him and to wait on him. So Zachariah walked out to a waiting crowd, waiting to see and to hear from Zachariah what it was like being in the Holy of Holies, and they can say nothing. He has to go home while everyone else wondered about what happened within the temple. So at verse 23 it says, And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days of when he looked on me to take away my reproach amongst the people. So God kept his promise. Elizabeth conceived a child and we read further on in the gospel account of this special baby who was filled with the spirit of God right from the moment he was born, even before he was born. The child that leapt inside the womb when her cousin Mary visited Elizabeth. And that baby was eventually born. So everything that the angel Gabriel said to Zachariah came to pass. One of the kind of significant things with Zachariah's muteness was the fact that he couldn't name the child. 
that'd be something that was a special thing that the father would do was to name the child that responsibility that lay on the father. So again, as somebody who can't speak, the words wouldn't be able to come out of Zachariah's mouth. And in essence, really, from the word go here, it was God that named the child, God the Father that named the child of Zachariah. And he says, you shall name him John. And Zachariah had to embrace that. We probably needed a period of time to accept it and to embrace it and to move forward with that. So later on in, the, in chapter one, we read of naming ceremony of John the Baptist. So it was in the eighth day after the birth when all the family were gathered together that they would name the child. Everyone would have expected this child to be named Zachariah. After all, that was the family name. But strangely, Elizabeth was quite settled in John. You know, God had done that work in Elizabeth's life and she was settled in that fact. But Zachariah, through the pregnancy, up until this point, the child has been born. He's been mute all those time, all that time, all those months. He's been unable to speak. He's been in silence to that point, forced to watch, forced to listen, forced to observe all that's going on and the silence that he was in, to ponder all of these things, to reflect on them, to ponder them in his heart until at last this baby boy is born and enters into this scene, this prophesied child that Gabriel had told him about. And at that point, we read further on um, in the Gospel account here, and it's in verse 63, and it speaks of Zachariah, and it says, And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John, and they all marvelled. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. So eventually, eventually what we see here is Zachariah moving from a point of doubt to a point of faith, accepting all that the angel Gabriel has revealed to him. He spent these few months mute, observing, watching, pondering in his own heart, and he accepts everything that Gabriel had told him, that he names this child John. He steps into all the things that Gabriel had showed him. So he moved from this kind of point of doubt, doubt and unsure of what was happening to fully embracing the full message that Gabriel had given him. He'd watched his wife conceive, he'd watched his baby grow within, within Elizabeth. He'd watched the cousin Mary, the visit together, how the baby jumped in Elizabeth's womb when they both came together. He heard Mary sing a song of praise that we read about in the Gospel account here. He saw his son being born, heard the first cry of life. And now he held in his arms this wee baby boy, a boy of promise. And he fully, fully appreciated and understood and believed all that God had revealed to him. So what we see is that God took a man who was probably too painful to hope for a child, too painful to, to think that things could change at this later stage in his life. And they transformed him into somebody who could only have this hope and this praise within him. And it says here, immediately his tongue was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke praising God. He could do nothing but sing God's praises at this point. So we see he broke into a song of praise. He came from somebody who was doubtful, couldn't accept the message of God, to somebody who sang praises of God, praises to God. So after a long silence, the praise came. This baby boy is born. And we know that John the Baptist fulfilled a very, very important task. And we read further on, just after the kind of naming ceremony in the Gospel account here in Luke 1 from verse 76. And as the Spirit comes upon Zachary, it says, A new child we called the prophet of the highest. He will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to the people by the remission of their sins. And in verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. So this miracle baby was born to fulfill a very important task. And Zachariah and Elizabeth were part of that as well. As we continue on in the Gospel account in chapter 1, that's one miracle birth. Another miracle birth is foretold as well. And in verse 26, it tells us about Mary. In verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of, in a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you amongst women. 
So first of all, we'll look to Elizabeth, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who are both good, upright people, righteous before the Lord. And now we move to Mary, who's called blessed and highly favoured as well. So we go from the, the kind of law-keeping priest, the holy one in the temple, the one that's in the holy of holies, the one who believes. And then we move to this kind of lowly, humble young woman in backwater Nazareth, this wee town that's unknown, where nothing special happens. And we see quite a contrast there. But the angel Gabriel comes to them both with a very important message. In verse 29, it says, But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. So yet again, like Zachariah, Mary was surprised and troubled here. And again, who wouldn't be if an angel came and appeared to you? You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't take it quite easily. You'd be quite startled and troubled yourself, I'm sure. And because of that, he said the exact same thing to Mary as he said to Zachariah, do not be afraid. And then he gave her the message that was for her and her situation. From verse 31, and behold, you will conceive, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And, he sh and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? So like Zachariah, Mary was told what God intended to do. And like Zachariah, she was confused, quite rightly so. But Gabriel saw that Mary asked and could have thought in these things and took the message in a different way from Zachariah. She had a humble desire to understand the message, how it was going to happen, to know the how, not the if of the message. She was not coming from a point of unbelief. She was coming from a point of wanting to understand. So even though Mary was not completely clear in how this was going to happen and the complete message, Gabriel saw that she shed faith and trust in the Lord. And in verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So when Gabriel explained the central role that Mary was going to play in this kind of whole plan of salvation, she was going to bear the Holy One, the Son of God. Mary responded with a kind of first reading, what we might think a similar response to Zachariah. How can this be, she asked, since I do not know a man? How can this be, I'm a virgin, how can this be? I can't have a child that's not possible without certain things taking place. And what we see is Mary was not disrespecting or disregarding the message that Gabriel was giving her here. She was just looking for clarification. And the evidence of that was the response of Gabriel to her. How Gabriel responded to her question is very different to how he responded to Zacharias. The angel Gabriel gives her an answer to her question because she's looking for information and clarification. She's not looking for a further sign because she's undoubting. And the angel Gabriel continues to say, how's this going to happen? Well, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And he then goes through the story of what's going to take place. So Gabriel explains further to, her, to, to Mary to allow her to understand what he is telling her here. And he even uses Elizabeth and Zachariah as an example. You know, your cousins, they were barren for so long. They were barren to the point where they didn't hope for a child. But even in barrenness, you know, they bore a child. That was a miracle with God and nothing will be impossible. He uses them as an example to Mary here. And Mary replies, Oh, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Let it happen, I believe. You know, everything you're saying, let it happen to me. I'm willing, I'm open. Let it happen is really what she's saying. She's accepting the message, whereas Zachariah didn't initially accept the message from Gabriel. So somehow Mary was able to accept the message far easier than Zachariah could. So she's saying, I'm here, let it happen, you do it. And she believes that with God, nothing will be impossible. 
there'll be many, many things going round in their head, doubts, fears, uncertainty about how this was all going to take place. But in the midst of it, she still says, go for it, God. I'll place myself in your hands. Go on and do what you've got planned for my life. So Mary had questions, but her questions were based on hope and expectation. She knew that it was going to be possible because with God, anything was possible. Again, let's contrast Mary and Zachariah. Mary, a very, very young woman, early teens, didn't have a lot of money, didn't have position, didn't live in a fancy place, lots of fancy people round about her. And then with Zachariah, the kind of priest with this kind of you know, really important role. His lineage was very strong. He married Elizabeth, who also had a strong lineage, came from the kind of priestly line. So we've got the kind of humble nobody on one side and then the kind of priestly religious on the other. And we see that God worked in both of their lives. The angel Gabriel visited them both. And for us, no matter where we are, God can visit us and work in our lives as well, whether we're, whether we're in one extreme or the other extreme side of the coin. But what we need to do is be the Mary, the one who accepts what God is saying into our lives, to believe it and to move forward with it, even if we don't know the A, the A to Z of how it's going to happen. So when God's promises and commands in our life come, when things that maybe God shows us seem impractical or impossible or unfeasible, we can ask ourselves, how are we going to respond to it? How we get respond to the promises of God when we look to, to our own life and we think, God, how can you do that with me? How can you change this situation? We remember the verse here, with God, nothing is impossible. Mary had a confession of faith. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Let's be the type of people that can echo that in our own lives as well. Let that be our attitude to having God move and act and be in our lives. So let's consider from the accounts here the repercussions of Mary's acceptance of what Gabriel said to her, that Mary's yes to God was a bit more riskier and difficult than Zachariah's. The angel's measure to Zachariah involved the birth of a baby boy. There was a birth of a boy into a marriage between Zachariah and Elizabeth, um, into a marriage, but for Mary, the, the baby was a child to be conceived out with marriage. For Zachariah, this child would have taken time, energy, money for this elderly couple to raise a child. But for Mary, the cost would be her full life. She had to give up her dreams, her plans, whatever she had planned for her life. When she can see that we're out of wedlock, there'd be the stigma, there'd be the kind of repercussions socially of that happening in their own lives. And that would be things that would be going through her own mind, the fears and the doubts and the uncertainties of how this was going to take place. There'd be a strain in her relationship with her parents. She'd have her fiancé Joseph to think about as well. If this is going to happen to me, I'm going to get pregnant. What's Joseph going to think? Again, Zachary didn't have to consider those things, but she did. The ramifications of the decision would cost Mary everything that she held dear, but she was still able to say yes straight away that she had the faith up front to say yes to the angel Gabriel here. In the season you're in just now, the Christmas season, I would say it's a season of faith. You know, faith for us to look to God, to put our faith and our trust in God, seeing who God is, seeing what God has done, seeing how God has moved in people's lives in the past, how he's moved in people's lives in the present and how he can move in people's lives in the future as well. And that includes us, that we don't have to rely on our emotions and indeed we shouldn't rely on our emotions. If Mary did, she'd be saying, oh no, Gabriel, that's not happening because X, Y and Z. You know, if we respond with our emotions to how God wants to move in our own lives, then that's not the best way to do things. Mary's mind would have been in turmoil as the angel Gabriel gave her this message here, but she still said yes. Sometimes our minds are in turmoil as well with our present circumstances or situations. But when God wants to move in our lives, let's make sure we say yes to him. We might not know how it's going to unfold, but we can know that he knows he's got a plan and a purpose and that he will fulfill it according to his will and for our own good as well. So in this season of faith, 
It's a time this Christmas time to think on God and to ask him to increase our faith during this festive period, to put aside our doubts and our fears and just to look to him to proclaim his goodness, his sovereignty, his plan, his purpose that we see in the Bible and the fact that he's came, he's present with us by his Holy Spirit and he's coming again to receive us to himself. We can remind ourselves that he rose again from the dead and that one day and one day soon we are going to be with him forever and eternity. It's a time for us to look to God and to trust him and to know that he has got our own best interests at heart. So what we've seen here from the Gospel account of Luke is a tale of two faiths and the challenge is to live up to the faith that works the best. There were similarities here, both of the people were visited by an angel, both of the people had a promise of the birth of a son. Both people were really unfit to have a child. Zachariah's wife was barren, Mary was a virgin. You know, how's a child get happen in that circumstance? And both responded with a, how? How's this going to take place? But it was the attitude of the heart which was important. The way that they questioned was very different. Zachariah and Mary questioned Gabriel, but their questioning is responded to in a different way because of their hearts. It's a tale of unbelief in one hand and faith on the other hand. And Mary says in the end, I'm the Lord's servant, let it be to me according to what you have said. We need to be this believing person, this person of faith. And she was willing to be a person of faith and to be the Lord's servant as well. Here I am, let it be to me according to your will. I will be your servant, I will do everything you ask me to do, Lord. And I wonder if we can be that type of person during this festive period as well. That we can offer ourselves to be the Lord's servant, to do his will, to speak his words, to act and to, to show the character and the nature of God to those round about us, to present ourselves as a servant to him, not needing to know the hows and the wheres and the, the why force of everything, but just to do what he asks us to do. So with whom will we identify this Christmas season? Mary or Zachariah? The one that needs convincing or the one that says, yeah, I'll do it straight away, sign me up. I don't know about yourself, but I can be a bit of a slow burn, a slow burner when it comes to things and other people are a bit more impulsive or a bit more decisive. For Zachariah, we see that his hope grew over time, whereas for Mary, she just went into things straight away. Whatever it might be this Christmas season, there's space for us all. For Zachary, he didn't say yes straight away, but then for a period of time he couldn't say anything and it took him a while to come to this point of faith. Mary said yes straight away, but yet nobody wanted to listen to her. She was shunted away to live elsewhere when she became pregnant. No matter who we are, what our personality is like, what our current walk with the Lord is like, is like we can all get things right before God. This Christmas season or space for us all, but what we need to be is kind of signs of grace to each other. And we see in the gospel account here how Elizabeth and Zachary and Mary and Joseph, how their two, two miracle births come together. There were signs of grace between them both, how they both came together, were both encouragers to each other. And this Christmas season, what I would say is we need to be that to each other as well, to encourage each other this Christmas season. Whether we're doubtful, whether we're fearful, whether we're faithful, whether we're troubled, whether we're perplexed, whatever our emotions or our fears or our, our current circumstances are, we need to help each other during these times. It's going to be a very different Christmas 2020, New Year 2021, but we're in it together. We're in it as people of faith. And if you're not in it as a person of faith listening, you know, this could be your time to get yourself right before God. You know, God is willing to open up a new life and a new understanding to you. As Zachariah had a change of heart from a person of kind of unbelief in the, the first instance to a person of faith at the end, everyone has got that opportunity as well this Christmas period. So God has got room for us all. We just need to make sure that we align ourselves the best that we can with him. God invites us this Christmas time to prepare the way of the Lord, the same as John the Baptist did. And we can do that by recalling the Christmas story to ourselves and to those round about us. All these events that lead up to the birth of Christ and all the things that happened after that point as well to prepare the way of the Lord in our world today. 
we might find a wee bit of new inspiration for ourselves, or even a wee bit of inspiration to pass on to somebody else. So we can wrestle with doubt, we can wrestle with trust, and we can look at these two characters today. But we see two promised babies, two ministries fulfilled. When we look at God's word, we can see it as sure and it is steadfast, and we can bet our bottom dollar and everything is contained within the Bible coming to pass. So two conversations from the Gospel of Luke, both very similar, but both very different as well. And just to finish us up with, Mary was told to name her child Jesus. And Gabriel would later tell Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, or he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus, Yeshua, and God saves. He is the saviour of all people. So today, we need to trust God to save us from our sins. Trust him to save us from our trials. Trust him to guard us, to protect us, to be exactly where he wants us to be, for his glory and for our good. So this is a time of year we celebrate this gift, the gift of Jesus, the best gift of all. And this gift is Jesus, God saves, who we need to believe in this Christmas time. So just to end us in this scripture, you will conceive and give birth to your son. You have to call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That is a gift to be contemplate today and at this Christmas season. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus. We recall the, the gospel account here, Father, of St. John the Baptist being born, Lord, and the foretelling of, of Jesus being born as well, Father. Lord, we just remember that scripture that with you nothing is impossible. And we remember that today, Lord, at this difficult time in, in the world, Father, as we face a very difficult and different Christmas period and a New Year period, Lord. Help us, Father, to remember with you nothing is impossible. And help us, Lord, to, to take the, the teaching points and applications out of what we've read today, Lord. Help us, Lord, to remember that your word is true and steadfast, that your messages and your promises, Lord, can be, can be relied on, Father. We give you thanks that you, you prepared the way for Jesus, that you prepared this miracle birth of St John the Baptist to, to prepare people for, for Jesus, the Messiah, coming, to prepare them for the way of salvation, to, to prepare them for that, for that journey of faith in their own lives. We give you thanks, Lord, that that miracle baby did come. And we give you thanks, Lord, for your Messiah, for Jesus, for the, the ministry that he undertook, Lord, for his sacrifice on the cross, for the forgiveness of sins. We give you thanks for the, the baby Jesus, but, Lord, we give you thanks for his ministry, for the adult Jesus and the warrior Jesus is coming back at his second coming, Father. So help us, Lord, to remember the full Christmas story, not just the baby Jesus, Lord, but the full account of his life and his his death and his resurrection, and he's coming again. During this time, Lord, help us to be encouragers to each other, Father. Help us, Lord, if we are going through a period of doubt, Lord, we can maybe do as Zachariah did, I was forced to do, to keep quiet, Lord, and to look and to observe and to see and to understand, Lord, that you will do all things according to your will. If what you say will come to pass, Lord. Help us, Lord, to take these things in, to contemplate them, to, to let them build our faith during these times. So this Christmas period, Lord, we do ask that you would indeed guard us all and protect us all, Father. Bring us all through safe and sound, Lord, and just be a blessing to us all during these periods. We give you all the praise and honour and the glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you very much, Colin. That was a nice, encouraging message this morning. And you know, it's a case that we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Lift your heads, guys. It was a dreadful world that Jesus came into to lift our heads, and it's a dreadful world that we face at the moment. So lift your eyes to the Lord. I remember years ago, I got involved in an organization that was founded by a guy called Demis Shakirian. He had a vision for the Lord that men were walking, men and women were walking around with their heads low and, and with no hope. And he founded this organization that, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, and there were many, many hundreds, thousands of people saved and, and blessed through it. So, the, you know, it's just let God give you that vision for your way forward, but lift your eyes to him, and as Colin says, you know, 
put your trust in him. Don't doubt that he can do his best for you. Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning, Lord. We thank you for calling for his preparation time, Lord. And we ask you would bless him for it, Father. And he would bless us through it, Father. And as we part for this meeting this morning, Lord, that you would undertake for us and keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So, guys, remember the Wednesday night is steady a prayer meeting as a collateral service at 7 o'clock, not half past 7, 7 o'clock. And then in Christmas morning, we'll have a short half hour between 11 and 11.30, and you can just uh, wish each other a Merry Christmas through that time. So thanks for tuning in this morning. We thank Robin for his praise and worship and call, and again for his, his diligence and his presenting of the word. And I thank you all. Without it, there'd be no service. Uh, so thanks all, guys, for coming this morning. And we'll see you on Wednesday or, or uh, Friday. God bless you all. Bye. Bye.